Hi, my name is Rachel Ross and I'm a senior in high school. I've always had an extreme interest in mental health because I know many people that struggle from some of these disorders that I research. I know how difficult it can be to experience this and I want to learn more about it. Through the process of researching, I realized that I wanted to present this in a more understandable educational format, a video. I produced, animated, and voiced a video discussing the treatment of insomnia with cognitive behavioral therapy and its implications on mental health disorders. The three characters in my video each had a different disorder that I cover, generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, and bipolar disorder that all have insomnia as a symptom. Anxiety is an uncontrollable excessive worry that also consists of unexpected panic attacks and can result in a variety of symptoms. Anxiety can also create neurological disruptions that can alter the brain structure and neurotransmitter signaling that can result from ex environmental experiences. Depression is commonly confused as sadness and, ex and is extremely common in the adolescent population. Depression is often a long lasting feeling that does not go away until it is treated. People that suffer from depression experience fatigue, loss of motivation, and loss of energy. Bipolar disorder is the third disorder I discuss. It is a serious mood disorder that has depressive and manic phases. The depressive episodes are closely related to major depressive disorder symptoms, but manic episodes consist of significant elevation of mood, resulting in reckless, spontaneous behavior. In some cases, the brain volume decreases, there are few, fewer neck connections between neurons, and there is reduced global white matter. After reviewing each of the three disorders, I discussed insomnia. Insomnia is broadly known as a disorder in which a person has difficulty sleeping. Many factors can contribute to insomnia forming, including being diagnosed with a mental health disorder. CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the treatments that targets specific thoughts or associative thoughts and alters them to break the vicious cycle of intrusive thoughts. Many studies discussed supported that these three mental health disorders had significant reduction in symptoms when CBT was used concurrently with other treatments such as medication. The character doctor in my video then referred the patients to a CBT specialist, concluding the video. Overall, my research found that CBT should be considered for treatment option while used concurrently with other treatments such as medication. Hello everyone, I'm Pratinov and for my collagen project, I'm exploring the effectiveness of induced pluripotent stem cells as a viable alternative for embryonic stem cells. The human body houses many distinct populations of stem cells across all developmental stages. Stem cells are a class of unspecified cells with the ability to produce specialized daughter cells. Most adult stem cells are restricted in the types of stem cells they differentiate into. However, one class of stem cells, which are the embryonic stem cells, possess the unique ability to differentiate into virtually any cell in the body. However, embryonic stem cells have been a source of ethical, legal, and social controversy since their first successful culturing in 1988. The ethical issues arise from the destruction of embryos in the early stages, which is necessary for updating the embryonic stem cells. Recently, an attractive alternative to the embryonic stem cells, which is being explored, is the induced pluripotent stem cells. There are many similarities between the IPSCs, the induced pluripotent stem cells, and the, in, and the embryonic stem cells. The research shows that once these cells enter the path of pluripotency, the IP induced pluripotent stem cells behave identical to the in embryonic stem cells. IPSCs also have a high replicative capability and can potentially regenerate all the tissues in the human body. One of successful application of IPSCs is its potential to treat chronic kidney disease. The treatment with the IPSCs reduces weight loss, improves renal function, and reduces fibrosis. This data represents a promising and safe strategy for the chronic kidney disease treatment using the induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, a significant roadblock is the time and cost used in making the induced pluripotent stem cell line. The process itself is very labor intensive and an average cost between $10,000 and $25,000 and can take about around six to nine months. Overall, 
IBS is still need a very high level of research and is indeed a very upcoming research topic since the ban of embryonic stem cells by the US government. This summary of differentiating between the IPSCs and ESCs provides a clear-cut winner of the IPSCs, which shows more promise than the embryonic stem cells. A lot still has to be done regarding the research on induced proven stem cells before they are ready to be deployed for their commercial, medical, and hospital use. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to introduce my product, which is a literature review about proposing possible solution regarding oxygen death zones by adjusting measures to local conditions. Let me first introduce the concept of oxygen death zone. Oxygen death zone means when excess bloom of algae cause a numerous amount of nutrients die and decompose in large numbers. The resulting low oxygen condition will be called oxygen death zones. This phenomenon have enormous environmental impact, which can finally lead to the death of a large amount of marine animals and then uh, the pollution overall the world. Um, next, I'm going to introduce the outline of my project. The first section of my project will be the goal, which is to clarify that I'm going to propose possible solution by adjusting measures to local condition. In the second section, um, I'm going to introduce three sites as example of the oxygen death zone. The first side is New Jersey size dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And the second side is the Chesapeake Bay. And the third side is the Baltic Sea. For each side, I'm going to first introduce the location of the site, secondly, cost, introduce the cost of the oxygen dead zone, and thirdly, introduce the effect on its environment. Uh, for example, to introduce the keystone species uh, which was being affected. And fourthly, I'm going to introduce the underway solution, which will be divided into two parts. First part is evaluate the commitment made by the government already. And the second part is to evaluate proposed solution by government or organizations. And for the third section of, of my project, I'm going to summarize characteristics of those sites. Uh, I'm going to first introduce the pattern of the formation of oxygen death zone. And secondly, summarize the pattern of the current effective pollution. And finally, I'm going to introduce possible solution to solve the oxygen death zone. Hi, my name is Ivy Lincoln, and I am currently a senior at Oakton High School. And for my Polygens project, I completed a review paper surrounding the history of eugenic practices in the US, and I intersected this humanities-based interest with current advancements in modern gene editing. My ultimate goal was to contribute to current ethical analysis of biotechnology, and learn how to prevent similar movements towards discrimination that were facilitated through past decades of eugenic thought. So I separated my article into three main portions for past eugenic practices, modern eugenic practices, and more critically, analyze how we could apply eugenics of the past to the future. So for my first section of my article, I prioritized maintaining a primarily American lens as the United States served as center of eugenic thought throughout the world. I also want to emphasize the deep racial history that is oftentimes suppressed in school curriculums surrounding eugenics. For example, I briefly learned about the eugenics movement in my AP US history class, yet I was unaware of how much of the legislation in America actually served as a source for inspiration of more extreme examples of forced sterilization such as within Nazi Germany. And also within this section, I tried to employ a more broad definition of eugenics to encapsulate limitations on interracial marriage and federal immigration restriction mm -hmm. to kind of display how eugenics specifically targeted minority demographics and many of its practices were rooted in ideals of white supremacy. So I led my next section into modern gene editing I mostly talked about the development of gene editing technologies such as CRISPR and many of its successes in current trials. Yet I also talked about current examples of the sterilization of women. For example, those occurring in California prisons up to 2010 and also lawsuits against ICE detention centers and their practices of sterilization. And finally, my last section was weighing out the pros and cons of utilizing modern gene editing. And I try to leave like a more personal interpretation to the reader due to the subjectivity of this issue. 
However, at the end, I kind of wrapped up my ideas with talking about how, as a community, we have a shared responsibility to kind of educate ourselves about the history of eugenics. And this applies to both students my age as well as current biologists and scientific researchers studying CRISPR and other genetic technologies in order to carefully approach eugenic practices in the future. And keeping in mind that we have the ability to forever impact the medical field and the overall treatment of diseases. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation, and I hope you go ahead and check out my article and hopefully learn something about this underrepresented topic in American history. Hi, I am Meva Nandamandala, a junior at Westview High School in San Diego. My project mainly focuses on a novel treatment for ER positive breast cancer one of the most widespread cancers in the United States. I have researched several clinical studies and I'm currently in the process of writing a review paper on hormone blocking therapy, CTLA-4 checkpoint blockade combination therapy for treating ER positive breast cancer. Among the 264,000 female cases and 2,400 male cases of breast cancer in the US, about 60 to 78% of women and 90% of men will be diagnosed with a subsect of breast cancer called estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, or ER positive breast cancer. The current gold standard for treating this cancer, hormone blocking therapy, has over 50% relapse rate within the first five years of remission. Immunotherapies, another treatment that has recently been approved for use with patients, improves the body's ability to prevent relapses, but does not work at the same rate as the hormone blocking therapy. I have chosen to specifically focus on CTLA-4 checkpoint blockade therapy in my paper. CTLA-4 is a checkpoint pathway in the T cells which inhibits their function. Inhibiting this pathway activates T cells and improves their ability to fight cancer. The combination therapy style is used very commonly in cancer treatments today, but these two treatments, hormone blocking therapy and checkpoint blockade therapy, have not been used in a widespread clinical setting. The benefits of this combination therapy, such as the high initial efficacy of hormone blocking therapies and the memory responses established by immunotherapy, could help reduce remission, increase patient survival, and improve patients' quality of life. Combination therapies are a powerful tool that will help advance future cancer treatments. Hello, my name is Jermaine Lay, and the focus of my project is around utilizing convex optimization and linear programming to solve budget constraint resource allocation optimization problems regarding the reassignment of incidents to a new fire station. Over the past decade, through global warming and climate change, fires have become more frequent and severe. Because of this, there's a constant lack of manpower in cities worldwide. When dealing with fires, arriving at the fire scene even a sliver of a second faster may result in many lives saved. To save these essential seconds, four models and clustering algorithms were tested to find an optimal location for a new fire station to reduce the average response time of firefighters. For this project, we used a data set that contained information about firefighting incidents in Iowa City. The data we used included geographic coordinates, response times, and other attributes that was used to differentiate between each incident in the Euclidean space. The main model that was tested incorporates knapsack problem as well as a clustering constraint to push the model to group a set of incidents while taking into account the response times. The results of this model showed that the clustering constraint had little to no effect on the reassignments of the incident due to external data that was not recorded or not inputted to the data set, which affected the clustering of the incidents. Although no strong solution was found to determine the new fire station location, four models were proposed and compared during the project and are readily available for future studies surrounding resource allocation problems with a budget allocation defined over a geographic region. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Christy Chung, and my project investigated how to conveniently track room occupancy, use the data to control automatic lights, and thus create a safer home environment for the elderly.
Falling over is detrimental to the well-being of the elderly, resulting in fractures, hospitalizations, and even death. Unfortunately, more than 30% of the elderly fall at least once a year because they are in unsuitable environments and suffer from impaired vision and reduced mobility. Falls could occur more easily when the elderly do not turn on their lights, lack sufficient lighting, or have to reach for light switches in difficult places. Now, automatic lights could help prevent these risks by providing adequate lighting when the elderly enters the room. But most commercial automatic lights either require people to stay within the limited detection range of the sensors or constantly make noticeable movements for the sensors to recognize in order for the lights to stay on. However, both conditions may be inconvenient for many of the elderly who have smaller and slower movements. Therefore, I explored a more sensitive technique of tracking room occupancy by tracking the number of people that enter through the room door and the travel direction. My method employs passive infrared receivers, a hall effect sensors, and various distance sensors around the door to collect data on surrounding activity. The sensor signals are sent to the Arduino board and then communicated to Python through the serial port on my computer, where the data are then stored into a NumPy array. I use a NumPy array rather than a Python list or Python array because the NumPy library allows for the creation of multi-dimensional arrays and makes it much easier to manipulate large data arrays, which was crucial in my case. Through identifying trends in the data arrays, the Python can classify a person's movement into one of nine scenarios, including entering, exiting, or just passing by. Afterwards, the number of people that are currently in the room are recorded. The lights switch on when at least one person is in the room and switch off after the last person leaves. Detection at the door increases detection sensitivity and could avoid false occupancy or vacancy detections. In other words, tracking the number of people that enter or exit at the door can prevent the lights from incorrectly turning on or off. It also ensures that the lights stay on even if the person leaves the sensor detection range. The lighting system can be easily integrated into senior homes to help mitigate their limited mobility in their day-to-day -day lives and make lighting more accessible. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa Fang, and I researched the benefits and limitations of genetically modified crops on reducing food insecurity. Food insecurity, or the lack of consistent access to enough food for a healthy life, has worsened across the globe due to recent conflicts political unrest, climate shocks, and the economic consequences of COVID-19. One solution to food insecurity is the usage of genetically modified organisms, also known as GMOs, in agriculture. Humans have been selectively breeding plants for thousands of years for desired traits, such as higher yield and better taste. However, waiting for specific mutations to appear can be very time consuming, as it can take many generations of a plant's life cycle. While it depends on the product, genetic modifications can not only speed up the process to approximately 13 years, it can also create desired modifications that are nearly impossible to get, even by selective breeding, as genetic engineering can directly alter an organism's DNA and are not limited by existing genetic variation. For example, insecticide producing corn is improbable to mutate, but biotechnology can enhance corn to have built-in insect protection with genes from Bacillus thuringiensis, a type of bacteria which produces crystal proteins that harm several pest species, but are harmless to humans. GMOs have already been used to combat food insecurity in various ways, such as increasing yields, adding nutritional value to crops, pesticide resistance, or greater tolerance to climate-related factors, such as heat or drought. However, there are limitations surrounding wide-scale implementation and commercialization of GMOs. These include general risks as a relatively new technology, the monopolization of GM crops, exploiting small-scale farmers, decreased biodiversity, and increased pesticide usage. But despite these limitations of GMOs, GM crops are still a net positive technology and an important solution to solving world hunger. Thank you for listening to my presentation.